One of the most impressive and moving of all Civil War memorials is housed in this handsome marble building in Atlanta's Grant Park. This is the home of the famous cyclorama painting, The Battle of Atlanta. The huge canvas commemorates the stirring events of July 22, 1864, when Federal and Confederate armies were locked in the bloody struggle that determined the fate of Georgia's largest city. The Cyclorama building also includes a museum with fascinating and colorful exhibits relating to the era of the Civil War. The emphasis here is on the calamitous period when General Sherman's army held Atlanta under siege. Many other aspects of the war are also covered. The star attraction of the museum is the Texas, an authentic old locomotive of the 1860s. This engine took part in one of the most bizarre events in the war between the states. The strange story can be told best by using the illustrations from popular news magazines of the Civil War era. In April 1862, a federal spy named Andrews led 21 disguised Union soldiers into Georgia to destroy a key railroad line. They stole a locomotive named the General and set off on a wild race toward Chattanooga. With Confederates in hot pursuit in the Texas, they cut telegraph lines and tore up rails. When the general ran out of fuel, the men were captured, and eight, including Andrews, were executed. Ever since, their famous exploit has been called the Great Locomotive Chase. Several movies have been made about it. Here at the Atlanta Cyclorama, you can see the original Texas, the locomotive that chased the federal spies. The engine named the General is on display in the town of Kennesaw, about 15 miles northwest of Atlanta. The Cyclorama program will begin in a few minutes, but there are some introductory notes we should give first. The Battle of Atlanta took place during the last full year of the Civil War. To see the story in its proper perspective, let's describe a few of the events that led up to the capture of Georgia's most important city. By the spring of 1865, federal forces had captured Chattanooga and were poised to move on Atlanta. The Confederate commander in northwest Georgia was General Joseph E. Johnston, a genius of defensive strategy. General Grant, the federal commander, gave explicit instructions to General William Tecumseh Sherman. You are to move against Johnston's army, to break it up, and to get into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can, inflicting all the damage you can against their war resources. Sherman began his drive for Atlanta on May 7, 1864. Johnston continued to fight delaying actions but he was able only to delay Sherman's inexorable advance, never to stop it. On June 27, Union forces launched an assault against the Confederates on Kennesaw Mountain. Johnston's men had dragged cannon up the rugged slopes and were firmly dug in. Repeated Federal assaults did not dislodge them. When Sherman began a move to encircle their positions, Johnston was forced to retreat once more. The Federals closed in on Atlanta. And so the stage was set. The next great battles of the war would be fought for Georgia's largest city. There, off to the west, the spires of Atlanta, ringed by almost 12 miles of fortifications. The Gate City on this July day of 1864, a strategic supply center, numbers 10,000 inhabitants, many still in residence, anxiously peering eastward 
toward the lines of battle and out along the Georgia Railroad stretching toward Augusta. In the distance stands the little white house of Mrs. Pope, a widow, with the Atlanta Decatur Road, now DeKalb Avenue, running nearby. On this particular day, the storm of battle finds its eye in and around this brick house belonging to Troop Hurt. Till mid-afternoon, nearly all the fighting had raged south of the railroad. But at this time, the daring Confederate success of the day is scored here by an assault of Major General B.F. Cheatham's division of Hardee's Army Corps, breaking the Federal line alongside this very house. The flag hanging from a tree in the yard shows what had been throughout the morning a federal signal station. Here, behind hastily thrown up logs and cotton bales, the South Carolina boys of Manny Galt's brigade are shooting it out with an already counter-attacking federal brigade. The acrid puffs of gun smoke like swarming insects seem to intensify the sweltering afternoon heat. Just to the rear of this Confederate salient stand five cast iron guns left there by the Federal troops commanded by Captain DeGress. But the South Carolinians could not remove these guns because almost all the battery horses had been shot by the retreating forces. Here they lie, dying and dead amid the battery's caissons. Beside the broken picket fence reclines the broken body of a young soldier. Answering his cry for water, another young soldier bends over him. Mortal enemies and blood brothers. The fallen Confederate and the ministering Federal are the Martin brothers of Tennessee. The blue-coated infantry, their torn flags aloft, steadily firing, are surging back to help their fallen comrades restore their line. Afar on the horizon is Kennesaw Mountain, which the Confederates had been forced to abandon only a few weeks earlier, after they had there held the Yankees at bay for almost a month. The commander of the brigade, fighting its way back toward the hurt house, Colonel August Mercy, is being carried across the narrow bridge moments after his horse was killed and he himself severely wounded. His lieutenant glances back at his fallen leader, while upward toward the crest of this hillside, a section now known as Copen Hill, astride his horse, the commanding general of the three federal armies storming Atlanta, the red-haired William Tecumseh Sherman scans the vast scene of mortal fury. This frame house, the plantation home of Augustus Hurt, brother of Troop Hurt, had since the morning of this day been serving as General Sherman's headquarters. The body of James B. McPherson, one of Sherman's generals, lies in this flag-draped ambulance. Shot from his horse by skirmishers a few hours earlier, McPherson lies dead at age 35. A classmate of his and a boyhood friend, General Hood, commander of the opposing Confederate armies, declared, No soldier fell in the enemy's ranks whose loss caused me equal regret. Another fallen commander on this day's field of battle is Confederate Major General W.H.T. Walker, also shot from his horse about noontime by Federal pickets. But in all parts of the battlefield lie the slain of both sides, of all ranks. Yet everywhere, comrades spring forward to replace the fall, as here, on his black charger, Major General John A. Logan presses forward as temporary commander of McPherson's army to spur on the resurgent troops of the 15th Corps. Immediately behind him, revolver in his hand, rides the hapless commander of the repelled battery, Captain DeGress. Other officers of Logan's staff follow at the ready. In this ambulance, also wending towards Sherman's headquarters, reclines Brigadier General M.F. Force, shot through the face at Leggett's Hill. 
Consoling him and leading his horse is the general's son. Many luckily unscathed soldiers fall victims to battle fatigue. Others on this furious July day are overcome by heat prostration. The outstretched wings high overhead are those of Old Abe, the war eagle, battle-seasoned mascot of a Wisconsin regiment. Here he circles above one of the 42 battles of his stormy career. Dominating the horizon to the east looms Stone Mountain, its dome visible above the trees, and the gun smoke from a sudden skirmish in the Decatur Public Square. The torn-up tracks of the Georgia Railroad provide an exhibit of a Sherman necktie, an iron track after it had been heated in bonfires of railroad ties and then twisted about the trunks of trees. These ties symbolize the Atlanta campaign because from beginning to end it was fundamentally a railroad campaign. Brigadier General J.A.J. Lightburn, on a sorrel horse, leads his division back toward the troop hurt house where its line had been broken. In dogged advance, pushing to regain their earlier position, General Lightburn and his men, bearing old glory, will eventually sweep across the Georgia wheat fields to the hurt house as shadows begin to lengthen in the failing afternoon of what for many of them will be their final hour. In full gallop, the Illinois and Iowa batteries rush to the support of the 4th Division under the command of Brigadier General William Howe. Turning in his saddle upon a rearing steed, Colonel Warner, Inspector General on Sherman's staff, views a fallen officer lying supine in the gully. At the Colonel's left is Captain Frederick Whitehead of Logan's staff. Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith receives a report from Colonel Wells S. Jones of the 53rd Ohio that General Lightburn, in person, is leading his division forward. On this bare hilltop, under their banner of pure white stars and royal blue bars on a field of blood red, the lads from Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee are pressing toward the edge of the wood as if to demonstrate what their leader, General Robert E. Lee, once said of these troops. They were asked for more than should have been expected from them. Three Confederate divisions are striving against overwhelming odds to regain this high hill now known as Leggett's Hill. Only the old, muzzle-loading guns, bayonets, and artillery made up the arsenal of weapons during the war between the states. Yet with such few weapons, the casualties of these bitter four years were staggering, as they were here at Leggett's Hill, with assault after assault being repelled, and the slope soon becoming mounded with the slain. And the victims were the young men of America, Farmers for the most part, from the south, from the north. After all the contentious words of their statesmen had been spoken, finally their lifeblood spoke. They are the youth. They are the slain.
Courageously flinging themselves from entrenched lines, Confederate troops descend the slope, bullets flying from their thinning gray ranks. One of their couriers, his horse getting out of hand, has hurtled well inside the Federal line and has become a ready target for bayonets and bullets. Whatever his message, it will not be delivered. Whatever his charge, it will not be met. So die many hopes, many dreams this day. So ends a battle, so perishes a cause. When the evening sun went down on this long summer day, the Confederate troops again retired to the Atlanta fortifications. Fighting defensively, as they had been forced to do throughout the battle, the Federal troops had not been dislodged from their ever-tightening lines about Atlanta. July 22, 1864 proved to be not the deciding date of the Atlanta campaign, but it presaged all too certainly the end not far distant. The very next day, cannon shells began to fall upon the doomed city. And five days later, Hood's forces unsuccessfully opposed the enemy at Ezra Church. At the last battle fought for Atlanta, the defenders at Jonesboro failed again. On September the 2nd, Sherman's army entered the heart of the Confederacy. For more than a month after the Battle of Atlanta, the Federals laid siege to the city and bombarded it with explosive shells. On September 1st, at Jonesboro, Federal forces cut the last rail line into the city. That same night, General Hood ordered his army to evacuate Atlanta. Before leaving, the Confederates blew up a large ammunition train. The explosion leveled a factory beside the tracks. The next day, near this fort, Mayor James M. Calhoun surrendered the city of Atlanta to federal officers. General Sherman, deaf to all pleas, issued an order that forced the citizens out of their homes. The city of Atlanta, being exclusively required for warlike purposes, will be at once vacated by all except the armies of the United States. The evacuation began immediately. Frightened and bewildered civilians hastily packed the few belongings they could, abandoned their homes, and straggled southward out of the city. Following Grant's orders, Sherman's men destroyed the depot, machine shops, and roundhouse of the Georgia Railroad. The ruins were then set on fire. The conflagration soon spread to the heart of the city. Sherman was ready for his next move his march to Savannah. He would burn a path of destruction up to 50 miles wide through the Georgia countryside. The flames and smoke of the shattered city of Atlanta filled the sky as Sherman's army set out on its devastating march to the sea. The band struck up a popular northern marching song. the Federal Army entered Savannah on Christmas Day, 1864. The march to the sea had come to an end. By early 1865, the Confederacy's prospects were grim. The war's outcome was all too clear. On April 9th, in the tiny Virginia village of Appomattox Courthouse, General Robert E. Lee signed the surrender document that ended the war in that theater. Two weeks later, on April 26th, in a small house in North Carolina, 
General Johnston surrendered his army to General Sherman, closing the campaign that had seen the fall of Atlanta. The war and the Confederacy had come to an end. We're going to rotate around one more time so I can tell you some interesting stories about the painting and the diorama. The word cyclorama is the American word for panorama, which is a European art form that was popular from about 1785 to 1903. A panorama is an extremely wide painting, one that gives you such a wide-angle view of its subject that you almost feel as if you're part of it. Now, when you hang a panorama on a circular track and connect its ends together, it becomes a circular painting with no beginning or end. This is a cyclorama. Panoramas had been brought to America from Europe since about 1790. They were taken on tour and shown around the country. All the big cities here had a building designed to display them. This was Atlanta's panorama building in 1889, where a painting called The Battle of Missionary Ridge was presented. Few panoramas or cycloramas were painted in this country before 1883 when the American Panorama Company was set up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin by William Vayner. He brought 12 German, Polish, and Austrian artists to America specifically to create what he called spectacle paintings. The Panorama Studio artist came to Atlanta in 1885 to view the battlefield firsthand. They set up a central viewing tower on the site where the battle had been fought some 21 years before. To ensure accuracy, veterans and local residents were interviewed. Theodore Davis, who had been a combat artist for Harper's Weekly magazine here during the battle, was the historical consultant. The Atlanta Cyclorama was painted in Mr. Vayner's studio in Milwaukee and first exhibited in Minneapolis in 1886. It went on tour from there and came to Atlanta two years later. The painting was put in a building on Edgewood Avenue near what is now the Martin Luther King Historic District. You probably remember General Logan there on his horse. Keep in mind that it was 102 degrees in Atlanta during the battle. And note what the general is wearing. A knee-length double-breasted coat with one-inch thick padding inside the breast. Also gloves up to the elbows, boots to his knees, and a hat. He would surely have died of heat stroke had he really dressed like this in battle. Well, General Logan had planned to run for Vice President of the United States in 1884. To ensure his reputation as a war hero, he commissioned this painting. He paid the Panorama Studios some $42,000 for it and named it not the Battle of Atlanta, but Logan's Great Battle. And that surely entitled him to dress any way he wanted to. But the painting wasn't ready in time for the election, so there's no telling whether it might have helped him or not. General Logan lost, and in 1886, soon after the painting was completed, he died. In the painting, just below Stone Mountain there, is an old cabin with a yellow hospital flag over it. This cabin was actually a Confederate field hospital during this battle. At the foot of the chimney, there's a small red blur. This is actually a red blanket in the lap of the only female in the entire painting. She was a Confederate nurse. This man on horseback near General Lightburn is the only black man in the painting. He symbolizes the freeing of the slaves during the Civil War. Cycloramas were usually about 400 feet in circumference by about 50 feet in height, but they often lost a little around the edges thanks to wear and tear each time they were taken down and moved. The Atlanta cyclorama now measures 358 feet in circumference and 42 feet in height. To add realism to the cycloramas and to increase its three-dimensional effect, the diorama was begun in 1935 through a grant from the WPA. In 1939, the world premiere of the movie Gone with the Wind was held in Atlanta. A number of film personalities came in to see the painting in its new diorama. Afterwards, Clark Gable said to our mayor, 
It's wonderful, but there's one thing missing. What's that, he was asked. Why me, said Mr. Gable. Why isn't Rhett Butler here? The diorama artists were quickly called back, and Rhett Butler's figure was added to the diorama. Clark was sent a photo of it, and soon sent a postcard to the mayor saying that he was very pleased because now the attraction was complete. And that's how Clark Gable got into the Atlanta Cyclorama. There are 128 Plaster of Paris figures in the diorama. To give you an idea of the calculations involved in creating perspective, at the end of this dirt road there's a little soldier standing close to the bottom of the painting. This is the smallest figure in the diorama, and he's only 20 inches tall. But he's 30 feet from this viewing platform, and the perspective is perfect. The soldier directly over my right shoulder with a sword in his hand is the largest figure in the diorama. He's 50 inches tall. You can't tell the difference between his size or my size or that of the smallest man because the perspective is so realistic. The original diorama was built on real Georgia red clay. About 14 tons of it were brought in in wheelbarrows and piled up to blend into appropriate foreground areas of the painting. Granite boulders were dragged in too, and a lot of real wood and brush were added to make the setting look authentic. But over the years, all this authentic material had bad effects on the painting. In the summer, when it was dry, dust from the clay settled on the painting. When it rained, the roof leaked and rainwater soaked into the dirt. This caused the painting to mildew. By the late 1970s, it was so disfigured by dirt, mildew, and mold that much of its original beauty and drama were hidden. Also, there were about 450 holes and tears in it, and parts of it sagged badly. There was serious concern that the painting might soon be damaged beyond repair. Then in 1976, the painting suffered its gravest injury ever. A severe storm damaged our roof. Water poured down the surface of the painting and ripped a hole in it large enough to drive an automobile through. The damage presented us with a choice, either repair and restore the painting or throw it away. The city of Atlanta, guided by Mayor Maynard Jackson, the state of Georgia, and four local banks put together an $11 million restoration plan. The building was closed in November 1979, and the entire painting and diorama were restored from top to bottom. The building was modernized, and a new computer-operated sound and light program was put in. This unique revolving seating platform was added for the audience. It can comfortably hold up to 200 people, a nice change from the old arrangement, which could handle only about 50 viewers at a time. These realistic mounds of Georgia red clay, the bushes and trees and big granite boulders, they're all fiberglass. The soldiers in canon, however, are the original 1936 plaster figures, only repainted. So, everything you see here is an illusion, but everything looks better now than ever before. And best of all, it's permanent. It's going to stay this way. The Atlanta Cyclorama, with all its improvements, was reopened in 1982. This marvelous memorial to our men in blue and gray, to their sacrifices, their bravery, their patriotism, will look just the same to future visitors as it does to us today. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs.
And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.